perfect. Great to see everybody. A bit of a delay, but great to see you all. Dave, Fran, Steve, Bill, Stephen, H, Eugene, Harold, and everyone else joining us here. Great to see you guys, and thank you for joining us here today. Um, I had mentioned live to our students in our last class from this afternoon that you guys were in for a bit of a treat, and of course you guys are right now. So uh, without further ado, we're going to get started right, right away, guys. Of course, we have a great guest of ours today, a close friend of Fausto's himself, uh, Jeff Hirsch from the Traders Almanac. So uh, Jeff is coming today presenting Market at a Glance, Current Trade Setups, and the 2018 Outlook. Um, I personally had the uh, pleasure of meeting Jeff a few different instances at our on-site course we try and set up once or twice per year. Um, he's been an in-person presenter and he's delivered an excellent webinar each and every time. So, you know, for this current edition, what he'll be going over with you here today um, is a review of the current market conditions and the seasonal trade setups. He'll be discussing as well the impact of the January barometer, the Santa Claus rally. Of course, guys, Christmas just a few days away. So he'll be talking about particular trends within the market that he's seen uh, from the past many of years right around the holiday season and going into the new year. Uh, he'll be discussing the first five days indicators uh, that you have towards your midterm year 2018. And aside from that, he'll be discussing a four year cycle and the best six months switching strategy that he has. Uh, so without further ado, Jeff, are you there? I am here. I'm going right. to share my screen now. Yeah, absolutely, Jeff. The floor is all yours. So once Thank we get the screen, for that uh, wonderful introduction, Josh. Um, I'm just going to put my thing on a slideshow and see if I can get this working right now. How's that look to you all? All right, looking good, Jeff. All right, Ron wants to know is this recorded? Yep, we're good to go. All right, guys. Thanks uh, for having me. Really pleasure to be here. Um, I was just referencing Fausto's, uh, you know, intraday trading patterns, which I have the – I insist on getting the mouse pad from him with the clock on it because it – not that I'm going to cover this today, but it really uh, mirrors uh, one of the pages in the Stock Traders Almanac and one of the first calculations – I did for when I started working for my father way back in the early 80s, uh, running numbers and uh, doing things uh, um, with an adding machine and graph paper using the half hourly closes of the Dow. And that's our half hourly trading patterns on pages 139, 140 of the current Stock Critters Almanac. So one, it's, a, it's no wonder we get along so well. So you'll let me, uh, I'll have to toggle back and forth a little bit because I don't have the same setup there. But um, just give you a little bit of disclosure from the attorneys. Past performance out of guarantee of future results. This is for informational purposes only, not, not offered to buy or sell any securities, do your own due diligence, et cetera, and so forth. So to get us started, I'm going to play a little game with you guys. So I know we're not going to be able to chime in so much, but you guys seem pretty active on the chat. So we're going to look at this this uh, massive numbers here, and you're going to, in 30 seconds, you're going to see how high you can count, starting with one and going consecutive higher, one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, et cetera. And there will be a slight purpose to this. So if you guys are ready, I'm going to say go uh, in, th in, a, in one second, and we'll do it for 30 seconds. Ready? Go. Starting at one, counting consecutively as high as you can. That's 10 seconds. That's 20. And time, that's 30 seconds. All right, you can uh, play along and, and send the number in that you got to in the chat. Anyone get 20 or more? We could send up a signal. Just give me a uh, humor me. If not, I'll just assume. Um, 75, 90, it's a bunch of people who are having some fun there. <laughs> those are more like it. Great, great. So just hang on to those numbers. 50, I find that a little incredulous. But let's um, look at the next slide here, and we'll show you the purpose of this. So here I've got four gray, line, or gray lines drawn on here, and I'm separating the, the, um, 
numbers, the, the random numbers into a pattern. So you got four quadrants, upper left, upper right, lower left, lower right is the pattern. It's a Z pattern. So the ones in the first upper left, twos in the upper right, threes in the lower left, and fours in the lower right. So let's try it again and see if anything happens differently. Ready? Try again. Go. 30 seconds. That's 15 seconds. Five left. All right, it's time. Stop. So I just want to know, I know some people were throwing out some numbers there, but see Grant's typing in there much easier. So knowing the pattern, you did better. Can, can I get that? Can you guys give me that one? Point being that that's what we do with the Stock Traders Almanac. We recognize patterns, and that improves our entries and exits. And much like the pattern I mentioned at the top of the hour, at the top of the, the um, presentation here with the, the daily trading clock that uh, Fasto has turned us all on to. Um, so with that, let's jump into uh, some other stuff here. Stock Traders Almanac now in its 51st edition, the last year's edition, the, or this year's edition, the 2017, the 50th, was dedicated to my illustrious father, Yale Hirsch, who basically put Wall Street, um, put market seasonalities, tr patterns, trends, and cycles on the mainstream Wall Street map. There were a few dabblers back in the early days, but um, he really put it all together in this one hand iconic reference manual and we've all been standing on the shoulders of his that's why i have this isaac newton quote it's also on the dedication page and now we have the 51st edition out there everyone's familiar with santa claus rally which we'll talk about he invented that he discovered it back in 72 along with the january barometer as well as the best six months switching strategy and a host of other intraday seasonal patterns the half hourly thing i mentioned uh is something that he discovered came up with uh, devised or you know really put down on paper and, and made it available for everybody um so we have the privilege of standing on yale's shoulders myself especially more than anybody else and just a look at what we've done over the past 51 years on the street we get to appear in a lot of these uh financial news outlets the 68 edition the first one that came out in the fall of 67 a little inscription from uh my folks to somebody who gave it back to me the 2018 which is uh off the presses and out there for sale wherever books are sold we also give one away for free with our newsletter subscription some of the other books we put out there i think that don't sell stocks on monday is a great title and it comes out of one of the pages in the almanac how uh mondays were doing quite poorly during the you know market the bearish market period in the 70s uh 60s uh you know late 60s early 70s and early 80s and then the super boom uh book that i put out based upon one of the the major cycles that yale discovered the 500 percent moves after war and inflation we'll look at that and then the market cycles book which uh covers everything in a nice succinct uh fun uh style i believe so we have a little offer that um i think might be available over here on the chat did i put it up here oh, i gotta put it up there now oh it didn't get saved oh boy i thought i put that up there for you guys to get to um let's see if i can just put this link in here for you just to get it nice and easy we got a you can see that you can get a free stock traders almanac and See if that link works over there. It's um, I'll work on that a little bit. You get a free stock trader's almanac with each subscription. I had tried to set it up prior, but it seems to have faded away. But either way, you got it. Thank you. So that's what we do out there. And let's move ahead with some a little bit about our philosophy. So everyone knows the famous quote from George Santana that those who fail to, re to remember the past are condemned to repeat it. But we feel that those who study market history are bound to profit from it. Um, we like to, you know, keep our friend Sam Stovall's uh, thoughts in our head as well, that using history as a guide, not as gospel. So our process is, you know, for 50 years, we've been analyzing and researching and testing pretty much every market trend imaginable. I'm always open to getting more from anybody who has them. 
We publish them in the Almanac uh, for 51 years. We update it weekly and monthly in the newsletter that we put out there that uh, you have the offer for. And we use it to build portfolios with our seasonal overlay, looking at cycles and seasonality recurring patterns with a, an eye towards trends in the economy. Um, a little bit of monetary government policy out there, but uh, we look at market internals and sentiment, you know, advanced decline lines, um, new highs, new lows, uh, put call ratios, bullish and bearish percentages, and then old school fundamentals and technical analysis when we're picking stocks and looking at sectors. The major cycles that we cover, war and peace and secular bull and bear markets, that's the subject of the super boom uh, pattern, which we'll show you in uh, its glory in a moment. The four-year presidential election stock market cycle, very important coming into the midterm election year, which can be uh, prone to a lot of mudslinging and um, also some declines, which we'll talk about. The seasonal cycles, best six months, worst six months, sell a man, go away. We all know about that. We'll review how that actually works and, and what it means. Uh, some sectors and commodity seasonalities. Not going to get too heavily into the intraday or, or monthly and other quarterly and weekly patterns right here, but we will look at the January indicators because that's coming up on the on the docket and we want to be prepared for that. So here's the big four-year cycle, um, excuse me, the big um, super boom cycle. This was a pattern that Yale discovered um, back in uh, um, 1976, looking at the markets uh, after World War One and World War Two, he noticed uh, that we had these rises. I'm going to see if I can draw here. Let's see. We've got these um, like rises uh, in inflation and a 500% move in the stock market after World War II, uh, rise in the CPI and uh, a big 500% move. Uh, you know, for the Nifty 50 stocks, the 50s and 60s, and then we have the um, low here the sort of uh, common point that everyone agrees that the last secular bull market started august 1982 at that bottom and then you know we're looking here for this pattern to uh come up again i'm gonna i'm gonna clear this thing here and we've got circled here in um orange or red and, and yellow the what, what i call what we refer to as the ned davis research bear market that bottomed in february 2016 and we think that we might have a reset there and we'll talk about that in a minute but the pattern that you know we're looking at here and the forecast that i made back in may of 2010 with the dow at 10,000, uh we put it out in the newsletter and then in the 2011 almanac was for a 500 percent move off the intraday low in 2009, which was 6470 to Dow 38,820, which is on the cover of that book, by the year 2025. People thought I was crazy. Our friend Barry Ritholtz even put a WTF in a blog post and we discussed it and it all really kind of added up with uh, about a 5% compounded annual growth rate from 99. And here we are, 25,000-ish, uh, and it's looking a little bit more reasonable uh, than before than, than it was back then in, in 2010. At the time, I was um, tasked by our publisher. Uh, we're just having a little slow um, load on my screen here. Um, for me to put out, there we go. Sorry about that. A little bit of a projection um, for the promotion for the book when I did the super boom. So I dialed up uh, all the Yale Hirsch I could, all of my own knowledge, the almanacs, seasonal patterns, cyclical patterns, uh, secular bull and bear market patterns. I definitely looked at Ned Davis's market in motion, dialed up some George Lindsay, and crafted this blue line, monthly closing prices of the Dow, where I thought the market could go um, back starting in 2011. The black line is the actual uh, Dow closes up through last week. We've made some adjustments as um, you know this this thing has evolved over the years, and most recently, in March of 2017, is the red line where we sort of raised the floor because of all the QE and all of the unprecedented uh, monetary policy, and we're tracking this kind of closely. Um, didn't get the dip that we were looking for uh, this summer, and I don't know. I'm not convinced that we're going to get this this drawdown here in 2018. I think we may be on. Um, a path slightly higher and not get as much of a pullback, uh, maybe something a little bit more tame than a 20% bear market, maybe, you know, 10, 15, 19, somewhere in there. So that's what we're looking at over the next several years, some sort of softness in 2018 and um, 
renewed strength over the next couple of years, and then uh, a real launching pad like we had in the in the 80s and 90s and, and other previous booms. So let's try to get a little bit uh, you know narrow here, drill down here in the four-year cycle. Let me just see if anyone's chiming in. Uh, okay, so 2015 was the first loss in a pre-election year for the Dow since Germany invaded Poland in 1939. Kind of a, a big moment. Doesn't really change the long-term history of the, um, you know, pre-election year. Uh, we did have a pretty good post-election year last year, um, this year currently. And uh, what annual return is required from now through 2025 to get to 30? Uh, I think it's about. That's a good question. I think it's in the right in the in the realm of the seven to eight percent on the Dow. It's it's just so standard. It's it may even be a little bit lower depending upon. Uh, you know, where we close the year at, but um, it's right in the average, you know, uh, annual gain for the Dow and the S&P. It's, it's nothing, uh, you know, out of the ordinary. So, uh, good question, Don. Um, the post-election year syndrome, normally a really rough year, a lot of big bad bear markets occur, wars beginning, but we've had some, some bullish periods uh, after 29, uh, down four years in a row. 1933 was up pretty strong. Then again, the 80s and 90s, as I mentioned, uh, all four um, up straight up in a row. Uh, then back in the 21st century, we had it down uh, 105, 2009, though the Dow was up for the year. It was off um, quite a bit and, and you know, up 20, 59% off the, the 2009 low. So this is a slide we put out last year at the election that, that I'm carrying in here just to show what we were thinking and what does Trump mean for stocks? Well, he might think a lot of things, but the fact that we have a Republican president and a Republican Congress is a positive for stocks because uh, they're able to, you know, at least now get some things done. The average returns with that combination has been 14%. Um, coincidentally or ironically, whichever way you want to think about it, with a Democratic president and a Republican Congress, that return is even higher at 16 percent so the market's expected to uh continue to perform better as long as um you know things continue to move along compromising being able to sidestep any sort of um negativity and continuing to reduce regulations across the board our forecast this is last year this time of year was something we're going to be putting out tomorrow for our newsletter subscribers this is how we laid it out our worst case scenario gave it a five percent chance uh, mild bear market, total letdown recession. Base case, moderate success, not a whole lot of change, a lot of compromise. Growth continues on a decent, tepid pace. Maybe we're getting a little bit more of that. We're sort of pushing the envelope of the single digit and uh, high single digit, low double digit gains. We're up in the, you know, middling double digits, 65% chance. It's largely successful, best case, only give that a 30% chance. We're not quite, this is, you know, Dow at S&P, NASDAQ's up, up that much. We are sort of pushing the base case here. So, um, you know, we were given a pretty 95% uh, chance that things be positive. I think that turned out rather well. Admittedly, a little bit conservative over the summer, but hey, that's, uh, that's our seasonal bias and that's what's going to happen. That's what's worked over the years. Next year, look for the midterm election uh, sweet spot. You know, we call that year the bottom picker's paradise. This is something to uh, look ahead. Um, <clears throat> first quarter, not too bad, as you can see um, uh, before the orange box there. But highlighted is the, you know, second and third quarters. Uh, pretty weak um, in midterm years. Uh, Dow, S&P, and NASDAQ, combination of a couple of percent uh, on the blue chips and even uh, near seven on the um, tech stocks. And then the big move is the fourth quarter of the midterm year and the first two quarters of the pre-election year. We're seeing some 20% plus gains and 32% for NASDAQ. So it's a great opportunity to jump in uh, in any midterm correction um, for a big bull move. Here's the record since um, 2018. Uh, Stephen, you did the math for us, still about 5%. To thirty-eight thousand from the current Dow. Thank you for that. That's that's great. Um, so just a little rundown of, of the history. We see a lot of bottoms here uh, since nineteen um, sixty-one uh, when uh, Kennedy took office. Uh, nine of the last fourteen bear markets have uh, 
bottomed in the midterm year. So if we do get something, I think it'll get um, cleaned up rather quickly and um, just not something to get all concerned about, but really a buying opportunity. And the reason is that off of those midterm lows, we've had this tendency for about a 50% move off the midterm bottom. You can see a lot of these bottoms have occurred in January. The other clusters around October. We all know about October phobia. And interestingly, in the pre-election year, which would be 2019, these uh, the largest you know combination or, or grouping of, of new highs has been in December, and a good chunk of them. You can see the 31st and the 30th on the last trading day of the year. So look for that big move in a pre-election year off the midterm bottom. So let's start looking at the January indicators. Um, we've combined um, the Santa Claus rally, which is the last five trading days of the year, plus the first two trading days of the new year, with the first five-day early warning system and the January barometer uh, as Yale created as January go, as the S&P goes in January, so goes the year. And standing on his shoulders, we've um, combined the three of them for uh, what we think is, is even a more effective uh, tool. So last year, we started tracking this um, in January and, and, you know, through the year and even posted some some things about it as late as the summer um and this is updated where you have uh in the black line is all positive january trifecta years up santa claus rally up first five days up january barometer the blue line is all post-election years since 49 republicans uh first elected term like trump is the orange line purple line is um all post excuse me post-election years with a positive trifecta, almost 25%. So we saw this back last year and, and kept our, ourselves a little bit more bullish. And you can see around the summer, we had a little break, but we did come back and we are kind of right in between uh, positive January trifecta and positive trifecta in post-election years. You can just continue that line. Looks like we're heading towards about 20% uh, for the S&P right here. And we're probably a little bit higher than this since I drew this uh, several days ago. Um, I think it was last, late last week. So just looking ahead till next year, we have the midterm years since 49 plus midterm years with um, after a positive post-election year, which we've had this year. Not a whole lot of difference. So that just um, keeps me thinking that, uh, you know, we're going to track that sort of midterm year rather closely. A little January break, a rise to mid-April. Maybe we'll get um, to some seriously new heights. It might be a little bit more amplitude than just 4%, but um, looking for some weakness during the uh, Q2, Q3 in the midterm years I showed you on that table. What's uh, We just sort of missed this, but I wanted to show you guys this for future reference. Um, the week after triple witching, which I guess is still on right now, so I guess you can still take advantage of it, right? We have uh, triple witching is, is the third Friday. This is the week after the third Friday. You can see of all week afters, uh, weeks after thir triple witching, which was last Friday, the biggest uh, bullish plurality is in December. Um, you've got triple witching. I'm assuming you guys know this. Um, third Friday of, of uh, March, June, and um Hold on a second there. March, June, September, and December. And uh, just a bullish fiber there. You see some big gains. So there's a little bit of a trading opportunity for you um, for the end of the week if you're not already in there. Um, the January effect uh, of small cap outperformance begins in mid-December these days. Uh, used to be that small stocks outperformed large caps in January. Our research has shown that that shifted to the last two weeks of December, you can see this ratio of the Russell 2000 and 1000 and the black line since 79 and the red line uh, this year, most of this year through, through uh, um, December. Um, and you can see this big move here um, just at the end of the month for small caps. I do own some IWM currently um, and a bunch of other small cap stocks uh, and some other mid caps and stuff. So we are in for uh, this ride. So there's a trade for you there. You know, once tax loss selling starts to wind down, you see the the little weakness in early December, as we did have some, and now we're uh, we're on the uh, you know the move and looking for a, a bigger move from the small caps. 
A little trade that we use, the only free lunch on Wall Street, not for everybody. Um, this came out over the weekend. Uh, I think some of them are still attractive. Uh, again, this list of stocks is on our website, the, the Triple Witching Friday. Uh, we take all of the stocks making new 52-week lows that are on the NASDAQ, NYSE, and Amex. And the following day, we run through them and sift through anything that's under a dollar and really thin or liquid or is a new issue or some sort of when issued or odd type of share or closed end fund or anything that's not a regular common stock. And um, <clears throat> we take the ones that are down the most and we put together this basket that is available on the website. Um, if you want to also check that out uh, with a free trial. Here's a little typical December action. Um, a little bit weaker in the post-election year. Perhaps uh, we're seeing some of that reflected right here, but but generally, you know, one of the better months. Um, as I was saying, we did have some of that weakness early on in the month, and we sort of had a, a little bit of, uh, you know, secondary weakness <clears throat> just before the end of last week and early this week, and now we are looking like we're ready to move higher for the rest of the month of December. The Santa Claus Rally. The first... Um, factor of the triple the trifecta that i've told you about this is the you know last five days in the first two days something that yale uh created the phrase that he came up with if santa claus should fail to call bears may come to broader wall written on the um top of page 114 of the current almanac and you can see that when there's an average there's usually an average of a 1.4 percent gain for the s p during that period not a huge number but pretty respectable move for a seven trading day period you can see the years when um, there wasn't a rally. You've got either flat years or bear markets in 2000 and 2008. Doesn't mean that you can't have a decline in a year where the Santa Claus rally is up, as we did in 01 and 02 and, um, you know, 2011. But, uh, you know, it's it's still something that you're – what you have here is, you know, most of us are away from the street, away from trading. I'm going away. Uh, with my wife and kids, and you've got uh, the professionals left, man, the trading desks and the trading floors and picking up, beating down uh, bargain stocks that have been oversold for tax loss selling, and that creates this general bullish bias. And with those guys or those gals aren't bullish on the market, it's a sign that things aren't so great. So that's one of the first things you start looking at for the, uh, the new year. Then here's a look at the trifecta for um, midterm years. We'll be putting this into a graphic form shortly, but for now, I want to show you some of the numbers. So here's all of the, the midterm years um, since 1950 that uh, you can see the different combinations of uh, Santa Claus rally, first five days, January barometer, then the subsequent February, the best and worst six months, the last 11 months, and the full year gains or losses, just to give you some color. And down at the bottom is the five years, not a huge st statistically significant sampling, but uh, that's what we have. And you can see that uh, positive trifecta is generally positive for a midterm year as well with one blemish there in 66. And if memory serves, that was um, Vietnam War related. So just a quick look at our market at a glance. This is something we, we post um, monthly in the newsletter. Uh, psychologically, things are a little frothy right now. I guess the holiday season is officially underway. But sentiment readings have been quite bullish, and um, they're likely to remain that way as the market continues to rally. Excuse me, tax re reform is through. People are pretty happy about that. Remains to be seen how that actually impacts Wall Street uh, going forward as the changes are, are implemented and people start uh, making trades based upon that. Um, fundamentals are accelerating. GDP's uh, up, climbed up to 33 uh, unemployment keeps dropping, inflation's uh, headed in the right direction, but um, that could accelerate if wage growth picks up. Corporate earnings have been quite satisfying, driving expectations higher. If everything remains robust, um, valuations, uh, if earnings keep going up, valuations could get back more into check. Tactically, things look like they're breaking out. Stochastics, relative strength, MACD indicators on the major averages have been rebounding um, since uh, uh, November. And weakness in um, the Russell 2000 has, has uh, you know, um, 
started to, to turn around, advanced decline lines are headed in the right direction, new highs and new lows, some of the market alternatives we're, look, we're looking at. So across the board, strength suggests that um, momentum has been regained and we're moving higher. Monetary policy, we got our um, expected uh, slight increase. We have a new Fed chair coming in. Mr. Powell has some experience. He's also got some Wall Street experience, uh, but um, mainly it looks like he's going to continue the dovish pace and uh, pretty much just carry the torch from Chair Yellen. Um, so with rates really attractive and accommodative and somebody continuing the same thing, uh, the street's going to be pretty happy. However, uh, just concern when a new person comes in that sometimes things might not be as smooth when they give their speeches or things are a little bit different. And seasonally, as I've been talking about, very bullish. Um, s and is the number one month uh, for the uh, for December's the number one for the s and number two for the Dow. Um, it's also really strong for uh, second best for the NASDAQ, the top one for the Russell 2000. So usually we don't have any sort of major fall in uh, in December. So we're looking pretty bullish for year end. So let's take a little jump into the seasonal um, trading uh, strategy. Just going to check and see if we've got any questions over there. Make sure everyone's all right. Okay. Making sense. So our one-year seasonal trading pattern, we're in the, you know, sort of heart of the, the best six months right here. And I try to break this. Down. A lot of times, uh, almost every year, people will try to refute the existence of this pattern and it's been proven uh by you know the scientific method to uh um be uh not the result of chance and and have predictive power so people that try to refute it go back to 1896 for the dow or whatever and that's a moot point and a fallacious argument so i'm showing that um if you take break it down to the first uh, half of the last century when we were pretty much a farming society uh, driven by uh, agriculture. You can see the red line that it was pretty much by in May when all of the um, agrarian uh, economic driving forces were buying uh, fertilizers and seeds and hiring people and fuel and equipment and driving uh, you know, cash into the economy. And then that would begin to dwindle around harvest time uh, in September. And um, breaking down the best six months from 1950 in the black line and also since the 87 crash in in the green line just to show that there's still some consistency going forward we like to look at things at different time frames so that we're not just looking at uh you know 1950 to the present or the last five years or the last 20 years i think five years is a little short but we try to compare um some shorter terms not much less than, than 20 years for most things uh to longer term um, periods to, to, to just show that the, you know, confirm that the pattern is still working. Looking at the um, best six months, worst six months comparison uh, since 1950, the compounded annual growth rate is 7.1 in the uh, best six months, November, April, minus 0.2 in the worst six months, May through October. A simple uh, hypothetical $10,000 investment in the worst, in the best six months, gained $843,000. It's a one-time investment, power compounding there, and the same 10,000 lost $116 in the worst six months. Adding in our MACD timing um, wrinkle, increases that return of the best months to 8.9% and expands the loss to minus 1.6. And using the power of compounding, um, by staying in this thing with that same 10,000 that, that uh, almost triples the returns, turning it into a almost two and a half million dollar gain on the best months and the loss expands to almost $6,600. So our strategy, um, I mean, I don't know how you guys look at things, but uh, I think the main key to success in the market is selling your loser short, getting out of trades that aren't working and letting your winners ride. So in May, we do sell some things, but we don't go away, we go long, and short different stocks, different times, mostly long in the best months and short if we see opportunities in the worst months. A lot of times we'll wait until July when the market starts to crack down. We use MACD and, and other tools, um, advanced decline lines. You can do some interesting options and leverage trades with uh, uh, derivative ETFs or just, I mean, the way we pick stocks, and I'll show you that in a minute, is just getting into, into stocks um, 
at the, the you know, those low points of the year, August, September, October, and starting to trim things down in you know March, April, May, June. So um, I'm going to show you a, a little bit of the. Oh, I got to switch back to the screen. Sorry about that. Uh, uh oh. There we go. Okay. So it gets some flack this year. Selame didn't work. People like to say, well, you know, it doesn't work 100% of the time. Yes, we missed some gains by uh, in the S &P, in the uh, switching strategy by being in cash during those historically bearish periods. Uh, that's going to happen. But you can see we did okay, uh, about 9.5% from our MACD buy signal back in October um, until the sell in May. Uh, our signal was a little bit late this year. We had some conflicting uh, readings from the MACD, looking at both uh, the S&P, both all three of the S&P, the, the Dow and the NASDAQ, as well as the buy and sell on both. So it took a while for that to get into agreement for us to um, issue our signal. But NASDAQ, uh, best six months with the signal, still worked better than the worst six months. Um, this is one of the, the things that uh, one of our uh, one of our subscribers has been really successful with and a lot of people use and this gentleman has um, been kind enough to give us a few kind words to show you how he trades this thing using his IRA account back he sent me a note back in 2015 that he got his buy, buy signal in October uh, with the QQ's at 98 um, he took about a one and a half million dollars out of his retirement fund and put it in the Q's waited for the sell 11% return when people were sort of complaining that they weren't getting any action in, in 2015. Uh, last year, or earlier this year, he sent us another note thanking us again, uh, nailed a nice 17% return in the queues, as you can see, just like it was back here, about 16.9, um, profit of $340,000. So it works, uh, even though we missed a couple of gains in the summer this year. Our sector rotation calendar. Um, I have a question. Jim, can we hold that question until later? Oh, I'd love to answer that, but I want to just keep rolling on here. Hang on to that thought. It's a good one. So sector uh, rotation calendar, again, you know, we've, we've compressed the numbers for years. Uh, a couple of new, a few new um, uh, tickers for these sectors. Some of the old Amex ones are gone by the wayside. They're now uh, S&P or, or, or run. So <clears throat> we're showing 15-year, 10-year, and 5-year for these sector seasonalities to just, again, to look at the consistency if there's something coming different in the short term or different in the long term. But you can see highlighted in the gray is that, you know, everything comes in a season mostly in um, October. We've got the B, meaning the beginning of the month. The M is the middle of the month. The E is the end of the month. Broke the month down to thirds to give it a little bit more, um, you know, specificity about when to get in. Uh, the oil, that's the oil stocks like the XLE coming into play right now. And I'll show you that in a minute. But let's just look at the benefit of long and short uh, uh, a sector trade. So here's the materials, a nice pronounced, um, you know, sector seasonality, very similar to the S&P. Uh, goes up pretty much October through through May, down May through October. So using a similar comparison to a bit different the S&P, we're taking the performance uh, by rotating being short the worst months and long the best months versus buy and hold. You can see that it's a 50%, 15% gain versus a 5.3% gain. That same sort of $10,000 uh, example, hypothetical $10,000, turns into almost $378,000 versus just under $40,000 for buy and hold. So you can see the benefit of uh, using the seasonal trading patterns in materials and other sectors. Here's the oil trade. Um, I've got the XOI index laid across, uh, overlaid with the XLE ETF. You can see the seasonal trend here from our trusty trade navigator software that we, we like to use, where we see a nice bottom point in uh, a low point in the December, February period. The actual commodity uh, of oil tends to make a low in February, though with the bullishness this year, we might not get any further dip. So this is a setup that uh, looks pretty reasonable. Uh, we've been rallying a little bit here um, over the summer, but we've settled down here in December, and I think we can get another leg up, especially with some of the bullish analysis that's going on there with oil. So that's our trade there. 
Um, copper, uh, I don't know if um, anyone's interested or, or trades futures or copper, but there's a, a couple of other vehicles. Um, I've got the two ETFs here, the uh, JJC and the uh, COPEX, the COPEX, the copper miners. <clears throat> JJC is the um, underlying commodity. You can see they track pretty well to the, um, you know, uh, continuously near-term contra near term contract. And again, similar to the um, oil pattern, we get this low point when construction tends to wind down and we get that sort of copper top in May frequently, again, at the, at the end of the best six months. And again, things were a little bit bullish. We saw a nice trade. This 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 trades pretty tracks pretty closely from June through August, a little bit of a pullback, not quite as uh, extreme as some years, but we've got a little nice dip set up here in, in September. And some of the other things that we trade here is a couple of stocks, which we've had in our newsletter portfolio for a while. Um, Southern Copper, and SCCO, and Global Brass and Copper Holdings is, is it BRSS, I believe. Um, a couple of very highly correlated stocks that trade well with the copper seasonality. So here's the ETF portfolio, um, just to see some of the things that we're, we're doing here. We're getting rid of a couple of uh, um, defensive plays, gold and silver, and holding them, just getting into most of these sectors right now. Here's the two copper trades, um, uh, JJC and COPEX, as well as the XLE, looking for um, a little bit of a dip to get into these below the market. Um, and just a nice little trade set up for us there. So our stock selection process, um, I said an, way back that, you know, the key to it is uh, the seasonal overlay. We're not just buying stocks at any time of the year. We're not just selling stocks at any time of the year. If they're not working and they're they're not they're not performing well, we're gonna we're gonna cut them if they hit our stop losses or or, or just start underperforming. But we look for that seasonality um, point that 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 strength in the year, that nice setup in uh, either August, September, October usually. Um, so we're pretty much going long in October and short in the summer. We're using a pretty robust uh, fundamental screen out of Zacks, the research wizard. Also look at Market Smith for some fundamentals. I know you guys are, are pretty technically oriented, but if you take some of these stocks that, that we put out there for um, as an idea, you can run it through your technical trading and um, have some, some benefit there. So we're looking for, you know, stocks that are growing, accelerating with earnings and revenues. We look for decent valuations. Uh, PEs and price to sales and margins and all that sort of stuff. Break them down into um, different market caps, small caps under a billion, mid cap a billion, five billion, and large cap over five billion. And the short side, we invert that. We look for ones that are breaking down, overvalued, and technically horrible. And we'll try to uh, you know short them at as they break through support or fail at resistance. But one of the things that um, we let you know we think adds adds some some benefit or add some juice here, is that if we find two stocks, let's say in the bullish side, that are all things uh, being considered, all things are equal, except for the following. If there's about, you know, a large number, say 20 or so analysts following it on the street, then the story's kind of out. And, you know, we're looking for ones that, we'll, we'll take the one that's got maybe four or five or so analysts following it, and that way when the story gets picked up, more analysts will jump on, and we're sort of getting in early and sort of getting some off the radar. And we're also looking for these stocks that are not trailing the market by a large margin and not beating it by a large margin. When something that's sort of sleeping and uh, under-discovered, under-followed, and then we roll into, um, you know, old-school technical analysis and look for some, you know, points in the chart that look like a good buy limit, whether it's a candle or a, a moving average or a gap or, you know, something, some sort of support where there's, where stock has, you know, been hovering around a level for a while. There's a lot of trading going on there. So we'll look at that sort of thing. So here's that uh, stock best we put out in October. Uh, decent amount of, uh, you know, housing and builders in there, some interesting tech stocks. Uh, one of these ran away, which you'll see on the on the next uh, screen. Um, and uh, one of them collapsed, we got out of that, got stopped out right away. But there's a few good ones here and we are actively in the process. I have some market, um, some buy limit orders out there for a bunch of these stocks. Um, so you can see how we sort of, couch it, give you a little description of what they do, a couple of metrics, uh, buy limit, a stop loss, and those of you in the sophisticated area like yourselves can trade these 
<clears throat> for all they're worth. So here's the current portfolio. You can see, as I mentioned, Global Brass and Copper Holdings been in the portfolio since December 14, continues to move up higher. Uh, that's one of the other things that you can trade if it makes a dip with the copper uh, seasonal low. Um, Southern Copper down here on the bottom. Uh, second one from the, the top on the large cap portfolio, been there since 2015. Still moving well, we're holding that. And you can see all the other new stocks that we put in there and uh, some of the decent returns we've had there. You can see that we try to trim underperformers and losers. Here's the one Argan that we got slammed on. Uh, Rudolph is going against us a little bit, but um, that does happen. So all of this action and, and research and you know screening has resulted in some pretty solid numbers updated through the end of September where our stock portfolio since inception in July 2001 is up 439% versus 190 on the Russell, which is kind of what we compare ourselves to uh, a little bit more than the S&P versus 106 uh, on the S&P. So we're pretty pleased with how the system's working and continue to you know trim losers and let winners ride and continue to pick stocks during the right time of the year with, with good valuations and a good technical picture. So that kind of brings me towards the end. Um, anything on gold or other metals? Yeah, we just sort of uh, got out of the gold. Um, it's uh, something that we traded for a while. It's going to be working. Bitcoin, I think, is very interesting. Uh, it's not something I've got the – it's not in my, my bailiwick, not the kind of thing I will trade. I did write about it in the Stock Traders Almanac as a potential technology of the future. Um, and then let me get back to uh, – oh, thanks, Harry. I'd like to see a week-to-week -week following judge with yearly seasonality. Well, I think you'll see some of that, Harry, in, um, in our newsletter if you, if, you, if you jump in and take a look at it, and you'll see how we, we track these things throughout the year and month with all the different seasonalities. So psychological analysis um, and sentiment analysis, you know, Contra indicators are funny. They can um, continue being a, a trend indicator for a long time until they flip. So it's really the switch uh, of a sentiment indicator like put call or bullish, uh, you know, investor intelligence, bullish advisors. So you've seen how things can be really frothy and bullish for a long time. And it's not until and even after that sentiment changes that the market will, will, um, you know, turn around. And it's different on tops and bottoms. You know, tops are a process. They take a while. So we could see, a, you know, a reduction in bullish sentiment and the market continue to go higher for a while until it starts to, you know, fall under its own weight. Whereas at the bottoms, you see a spike, a uh, capitulation low in negative uh, sentiment, like a, a put call ratio spike or a big number of bears. And that'll change much more quickly, kind of a more like a V bottom than sort of a, a topping process. So again, here's the, um, did I get my offer up there? Let's see, can I edit it? That'll bring you to here. So um, again, you can get a free copy of the Almanac. You can go get yourself one at the store or Amazon. And we do weekly alerts. Um, and research on the market patterns that a lot of which I showed you today, uh, the broad market, individual stocks and ETF and sector trades. Um, you get a free almanac every year. The 2018 is out. Um, I've got, we've got plenty of them around and it's a pretty good deal. 150 for one year versus what 1995 per month and 250 for two years, probably uh, the best deal out there. I think it's a, a lot of research, a lot of, um, great stock trading ideas and, and sector rotation ideas. And I also do one-on-one -on -one stuff and in institutional research. We work with Probabilities Fund, which has a um, has empowered a form of seasonal market timing inspired by the Almanac. And it's a publicly traded mutual fund. And I am the chief market strategist of Probabilities Fund Management LLC, the, the um, RIA that uh, is the portfolio manager. Their ticker is P-R-O-T-X, or you can look it up or shoot me a note if you're interested in looking at that. I, I do own um, some of that fund as well. So uh, let me see if I get any other questions. Um, send up the recording. 
GMO in Boston, 100 billion AUM, says that stocks will produce an average negative return for the next seven years. Uh, I, I, uh, I think that's really good negative advertising. I just disagree. All of my research is, is um, not looking at negative returns for the next seven years, unless that's some sort of net of inflation type of calculation that they're looking at. But uh, that's something that'll get attention. Uh, recording, what about, is that U.S. dollar and the Canadian dollar? That's not a trade that I that I look at. I mean, um, I guess the loonies uh, hasn't been all that strong against it. Um, I have a couple of seasonal trades I look at. The pound has been the only one that's really been um, worth worth trading on a seasonal basis. There's a year end trade um, which is coming around, and um, also the one just uh, near the um, end of their fiscal year in March April. What are your settings? Uh, thank you, Grant. Uh, PK, settings for MACD, buy and sell. Let's see if I can even just, <coughs> excuse me, show you that. Okay. 817, the F is just well, the way they know it. At nine, you can see the nine over here in the pink line. Um, and 1226 on the sell side. You see, same thing as the topping process taking longer. That's why you have a slower, longer MACD, and uh, for bottoms being more of an event, that's why you have a faster, shorter MACD. I know there's a difference. Um, if the pound trade sets up, we'll send an alert. Um, we'll definitely send that out. I mean, it's it's went out last year. Um, if it's not setting up, you know, we might just mention it, but we're not going to um, – force people or at least encourage people to go into something that's not setting up. It's not just seasonality. It's seasonality and, and cycles and patterns of trends with good trade setups. So um, I guess we've got a few more minutes. If anyone wants to rattle off another one, um, you're welcome. And uh, I could just roll through to the end here. Let's see. Emerging markets had a great year. What to inspect in 2018? I think there's some speculation that um, emerging markets are uh, not necessarily um, primed for continuation of gains in, in, in you know the same level of uh, of gains in 2018. Um, perhaps the you know tax um, law will will bring people back into the U.S. more, but uh, you know, I, I'm not a huge trader of emerging markets. I think it's a good place for people to be, but um, I'm not expecting as much in 2018 as we had in, in 2017. Free lunch buys were sent out. They're on the website. They were sent out on Saturday morning. They're up there. You can take a free trial and check it out if you'd like. The Siller, the Schiller Cape Ratio says that stocks are overvalued at the present time. Any thoughts? I agree. They can get more overvalued. <laughs> they are quite overvalued. Earnings can catch up with it, though. Um, but yeah, they're pretty pretty richly valued right now. Uh, is seasonal secretary is now part of the almanac, um, which part of the newsletter, and we are working on putting out um, a commodity traders almanac. I know a lot of people are pushing for that. Thank you, Dave. Knowledge is the key, and we like to turn knowledge into wisdom and that wisdom into non-correlated alpha. FDX is now soon downturn. I'm uh, not sure what you're talking about with FDX. Do we have a projected graph for 2018? Um, I think it'll track a midterm uh, chart that I looked at. What do you mean what wheels – but will you send out your buys for the free lunch trades? It, it it's out. I mean, let me. Uh, can I can I share another screen? I'll show them to you. I mean, it's it's. Uh, let's see. Let me let me try to share something else here. Um, 
I'll just share my entire screen. And, uh-oh, that was a bad idea, wasn't it? Whew, sorry about that. Free lunch, right here. Whoops. I don't think I did that right. I'm gonna. Oh, God, guys, I'm sorry. How do I get that back on here? Oh. Um, well, I incorporate in the portfolios. Yeah, they're in there. They, they will get moved. I think that, I think it was on the list. Um, let me go back to this one. This um, no, they're not in there yet because this came out afterwards. They'll, they'll be in here. <laughs> With all the hair, <laughs> you know, that's funny. We did a um a, a conference with Brit Holtz and Josh Brown for the uh, the fund, and I took a picture with uh, my co my partner Joe Childry. Um, who's about six three or something like that and josh brown who's about six foot and me about five eight and standing in order of height and i posted on twitter and i said in order of height and somebody else put in order of hair so thanks i can get that from my brother uh what sectors we recommend during 2018 first quarter well let's let's go to the guidebook and look at the sector seasonality calendar. First quarter, there's a short for um, computer tech, uh, short one there, like, a, you know, so that sort of ends. Natural gas, high tech utilities, and um, also these are the stocks. In the commodity end, uh, just from memory, gas and oil both come in in February. So we're looking at some um, utilities and natural gas trades, you know, related to the cold weather. So those are a few of our trades. And um, <laughs> it's okay, Grant. Uh, seems like Chalamet is even more pronounced in midterm election years, which implies to definitely sell on May 1st. I wouldn't sell on May 1st. I would use MACD or some other indicator to get out when momentum shifts. And I wouldn't sell everything and sell out and what we do is we sell losers we tighten up stops on long positions and we look to take some defensive positions either in gold silver bonds uh tlt and agg we look at and also we'll look for some shorts so i'm not just going to dump everything and 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 bury my head in the sand i'm going to make some <laughs> excuse me tactical moves um as i said getting rid of losers very important tightening up some stops on the ones we're holding on to, taking a little defense. And Probabilities Fund is a, is a great, you know, place for that sort of uh, alternative investment downside protection because we're going to be trading in and out of the market uh, on any given day, you know, an ETF uh, basket of, you know, Dow and S&P type ETFs um, using our seasonal trading calendar in, in the Almanac and the other, you know, overlays we have on there. You know, for example, we were short for Brexit because it's the end of June after triple witching. So I think uh, we're hitting up on 5.30. Um, unless there's – you're welcome, Don. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Uh, I'm going to sign off, I think, unless um, there's another question that is pressing. And Again, there's the code, one-year CTU 17 or two-year CTU 17. You just go to Stock Traders Almanac. Um, maybe these guys will send out that code. I tried to do that ad properly, but I don't think I really did that right. So 
I want to thank you guys for having me. Thank you to Fausto. Um, appreciate it. Hopefully uh, he and I will get together soon. Maybe I'll come out for one of the events out in the Long Island. Um, and Josh, thanks very much. Thank you, Eric. So with that, I wish you all a belated happy Hanukkah, a Merry Christmas, and a Happy New Year, and all good things, health, happiness, prosperity, um, and hope you have some laughs over the holiday season. Thank you.